We are honored to have two distinguished speakers this morning. As they speak, please ask yourself, what can I do to see and know our invisible God? What measures can I take? What obstacles do I face? How can this help me, my family, my community? One of our presenters is Rabbi Gordon Tucker. Rabbi Tucker has been the senior rabbi of Temple Israel Center, a conservative synagogue in White Plains, New York, since August 1994. He is also adjunct assistant professor of Jewish philosophy at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and chairman of the board of the Assorti. Past chairman. Past chairman. Past chairman. Past chairman of the Masorte Foundation of Conservative Judaism in Israel. He serves on the Rabbinical Assembly Committee on Jewish Law and Standards. He holds an AB from Harvard, a PhD from Princeton, and rabbinic ordination from the Jewish Theological Seminary. And I am familiar most with Rabbi Tucker's uh, primarily from reading with wonder his masterful work in the translation, editing, and commentary on Abraham Joshua Heschel's. Torah Mina Shamayi, Heavenly Torah is rebranded through the generations. Now I'd like to introduce David Singer to represent, uh, to introduce Rabbi Kushner. Rabbi Kushner is the Rabbi Laureate of Temple Israel of Natick, uh, about an hour from here at my synagogue. He's a native of Brooklyn, New York. He's the author of more than a dozen books on coping with life's challenges, including the best-selling Conquering Fear and Overcoming Life's Disappointments. Uh, the Seattle Times quotes his newest book, The Book of Job, when bad, when bad things happen to a good person, as one critical acclaim, supported by thoughtful scholarship and Kushner's skill and using modern concepts without leaking treatment. And now my question. Thank you, David. And I would thank the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs for inviting me to this very exciting conference. And I would commend you on the choice of your topic for this morning's session, Learning to See an Invisible God. When I was studying for the rabbinate, the name of my school in English was Jewish Theological Seminary of America. And the name in Hebrew was Bet Midrash the Rabbanim of America, the Academy for Training Rabbis in America. Notice what got left out. As if there was no Jewish term for theological. As if theology was a discipline left to other religions. What happened is, I think, the events of recent years, things happening to our people, to our world, and things happening to our families, compel us to ask some of the questions about God that my rabbinical school did not consider necessary. Perhaps the most challenging question that can be put to an advocate of traditional religion is, how can you ask me to believe in the reality of God when God is an entity I can't see, can't hear, and can't acknowledge? The Bible is full of God appearing to people and speaking to people. It hasn't happened to me. Why should I believe in God? And the answer to that question is found in what I would suggest is the single strangest verse in the entire Torah. It comes to the book of Exodus and Parshat Ki Tisa. The Israelites have just built a golden calf. God gets very angry at them. Hours after they promise not to worship idols, they're worshiping an idol. God wants to destroy them. He has Moses kill 3,000 of them. Then Moses goes up the mountain. And Moses says to God, you've got to understand these people. Seven weeks ago, there were slaves in Egypt. That Egypt is a country where everything is visible, that if you expect that people to take it seriously. They can't get their heads around the God they can't see. If I could just have a peek at you, that I can go down and I can tell the people what you look like, and that will satisfy you. God says to Moses, you're as bad as they are. You don't get the point. I am not a person. I am not an old man who lives in the sky. I, 
uh, pet soapfish back home that is decorated with a picture of Michelangelo from the Sistine Chapel, God reaching out to bring life to Adam. And that's the image a lot of people have of them. God says, Moses, you can't see me. There is nothing to see. But I'll tell you what. And this is the verse I was never able to understand. God says to Moses, hide here in this cleft in a rock. I will pass by. You can't see my face. You can see my back. Uh, what one colleague of mine says, it's not a theophany, but a theophany. <laughs> How do you possibly understand that verse? God has just ordained the killing of 3,000 Israelites because they thought of capturing him in a physical image and he's telling Moses, you can see me, just not my face, you can see my back. And Moses hides, God passes by, Moses sees his after his passing. I understand that, and this is the only way I can make sense of the verse, to say, you cannot see God as an object you can see the difference God makes. You can see the impact that God has. And ours is perhaps the first generation that can really understand that. You know why? No scientist has ever seen an electron. But every scientist believes that electrons exist. Why? Because when they look through their microscopes, they see things happening which could only happen if electrons were real. And it's on that basis that Moses sees God. And it's on that basis that I would urge you to recognize the reality of God. You cannot see God. Other religions to remain nameless will show you pictures of God. And they get in a lot of trouble when they do that. Because you draw a picture of God, you're telling people God is not God is male, not female. God is old, not young. God is muscular. It's very limiting. The example I'd like to give, picture a 50-year-old computer engineer, Roman Catholic, just been let go by his company, replaced by a 30-year-old hotshot Jewish guy with a beard and jeans, right out of school. He can do things that an older guy can't even begin to do. The man who's been let go is distraught. How's he going to pay his bills? I'm going to send his kids to college. He stops off at church for comfort on the way home, looks up on the altar, and what does he see? God portrayed as a 30-year-old Jewish man with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> so I would suggest the real question is not, who is God? Where is God? What does God look like? The real question is, when is God? When is God? What has to be happening for you to discover that God is real? I learned this the hard way. I had a traditional Jewish religious upbringing like many of you did. When my wife and I found out that our two-year-old son was born with an incurable disease and would die in his early teens, I was devastated. We were the most religious family in town. If God could do this to our family, what was the point of being religiously committed? I was not sure I could continue as a rabbi while my son was dying. My answer was to see God not in the inflicting of the disease, but in our coming up with the qualities we needed to deal with the disease. And God said to my wife and me on New Year's Day, 1963, before this year is out, you will have a child with the following health problems. This is what it will mean to your marriage. This is what it will mean to your career as a rabbi. This is what it will mean to your religious life. Can you handle it? I guarantee my wife and I would have said, please don't have something. That's more than we can imagine ourselves doing. But from some source, which I cannot otherwise identify, we came up with exactly the qualities of soul we did not believe we had. And we were able to go. When is time? What is happening in our lives to believe in the fidelity of God? The best clue is, what are those occasions for which you recite a bracha? What entitles you to say, Baruch Atzah Adonai? Praise are you, O Lord, unless you feel that God is present in that moment. When you've been sick, and you just had to work and feel lousy, one morning you wake up and you feel good again. You have experienced God and the ability of the human body to heal itself.
yourself and the ability of doctors to cure you. And you recite the bracha, praises God who is both faith, holy, holy, and holy as who heals the sick of Christ. When life calls on you to do something that you think is too hard, a challenge you're not sure you can meet, adjust to a loss, adjust to the, the disappearance of a lifelong dream, and somehow you do it, you have met God in giving you qualities of soul that you did not believe you had. God is an oten la yev koah. God gives strength to the challenge. When you try to understand something, program your new smartphone, do something on the computer, whatever it is, <laughs> and it's hard and you can't get it, you're about to give up and then you figure out how to do it, you become comfortable with it, you have met God and the ability of the human mind to grow. When you do something you're embarrassed by, and you think you're really gonna get in trouble, and you find within other people in your life the ability to forgive, you have met God, because God forgives us, God gives us the ability to live and love flawed, imperfect people, to forgive them and to be forgiven. He is Hanun Amarbet. Six weeks from now, it's already Rosh Hashanah. It comes distressingly early this year. <laughs> when you're in shul on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, pay special attention to Torah reading. It's all about people learning to see God. When Abraham finds that a dream he had just about given up on is actually coming true, he sees God. When Hagar was feeling at the point of giving up, of despair, life is being meaningless to her, and she discovers resources in the world, the Torah reading will explicitly say her eyes were open. She sees God in a way she did not see before. And the name of the parasha from which the Rosh Hashanah readings are taken, you remember? Parshat Vayera, God was seen. This is what Jewish life is about. Not talking about God, not analyzing God, learning to recognize when something had happened in your life which would not have happened if God were not real, if God were not active, if God were not doing for us things we could not do for ourselves. Thank you very much. grateful to the uh, Federation for um, inviting me to do this and uh, for giving me the privilege of being on uh, on this uh, dais here with uh, distinguished colleague and, and friend Rabbi Kushner. I'm going, <coughs> going to start with what to me is um, one, I think one of the most beautiful brachot that I know. It appears in the in the Talmud and Tractate Chagiga. It's uh, part of a little story, a little narrative about Rabbi Judah the Patriarch and Rabbi Chia who were, uh, who were traveling uh, together. And they passed a little town and they asked uh, someone whether there was a scholar there in the town. He said, yeah, there is a scholar here in the town. Uh, and by the way, he doesn't see, he's blind. Uh, and the two of them went to pay their respects to him. Same way when we travel, we look, out, look for the local shul, they did the same thing, and they spent some time with this blind scholar. And when they were leaving, he gave them the following bracha. Atem hikbaltem panim hanirim ve'enam roim. You have now paid your respects to a presence, a face, literally, a presence that can be seen but can't see. Tizku l'hakbil panim haroim ve'enam nirim. May you be privileged to be received and to be have respect paid to you by the one who can see but can't be seen. It's a really beautiful bracha. And one of the, th one of the things it tells us is that um, we, we see God in these moments of uh, kindness and compassion and connection in the same way that Rabbi Krishna has just laid out for us. 
I'm going to give a little different twist on this uh, before I'm done, but I wanted you to have that bracha in mind. Uh, what I have for you this morning comes from an eclectic set of sources. Uh, the Mechilta Perush on a rabbinic uh, commentary on the book of Exodus, the Sifre, um, commentary on the book of Devarim, the British anthropologist Gregory Bateson, uh, president of NYU John Sexton, Jan Martel, and the late uh, philosopher Robert Nozick. And it's eclectic in this way, I think because we're talking about something that is so universally part of the human condition that it really appears everywhere. So here's the Mechilta. When the Israelites were at Mount Sinai, we're told that they said, Ritzonenu lirut et malkenu. Our desire is, our real wish is, we want to see our new sovereign, the same way we saw our old sovereign in Egypt. We want to see this new sovereign. And it seems that this is a pretty universal desire and drive. It's the drive to see. It's the drive to know. We often use the expression seeing is believing, but it's not seeing is believing. Seeing, we feel, is knowing. And we want to know. We want to know that our prayers will be heard. We want to know that virtue will be rewarded. We want to know that our sacrifices will be requited, that there'll be a heaven and an afterlife, an afterlife where we probably fantasize that we'll be reunited with our individual selves and our egos and perhaps pick up where we were so rudely interrupted by death. <laughs> we want to know all of those things. I think that's what's captured in that phrase, Ritzonenu lirotit malkin. But God can't be seen, as you just heard. You know what the, the most common uh, representation of God in the Torah is? A cloud. It's cloudy. You can't see through a cloud, it's opaque. And so the frustration is set up. We have this inbuilt desire to know something that can't be known, to see something that can't be seen. It's a frustration that is worthy of the cynical critique of Kohelet. So here's another text, and it comes from the Sifre, providentially from this week's parasha, Akiv. You want to get a familiarity with, connect with, be able to recognize the one who spoke and the world came into being, a wonderful uh, locution for God. The answer is, you want to do that? Lemad agada. Learn agada. Learn the art of narrative. Shemitochkach atamakir misha amar v'hayahulam umidabek bitrachav. If you do that, you will learn to recognize the one who spoke in the world came to be, and you will have an intimate connection with God's ways. So what does it mean to say this? It's telling us to what? Learn to tell stories? Learn to hear stories? So here's where the British anthropologist Gregory Bateson comes in. This is what he says in the introduction to his book, Mind and Nature. He tells this little fantasy story. A man wanted to know about mind, not in nature, the sort of thing we would call today artificial intelligence. He wanted to know about mind in his private, large computer. Computers were large in those days. So he asked the computer, do you compute that you will ever think like a human being? And the machine went to work analyzing its own computational habits. And finally, the machine printed out its answer on a piece of paper. The man ran to get the answer, and he found he could type the words. That reminds me of a story. <laughs> Stories, agadot. See, even people who study artificial intelligence somehow know that there's something essential to human thought about narratives. They're not the sorts of things that are supposed to have the same kind of truth values as matters of cold, verifiable fact. For example, the temperature in this room, which is a cold, verifiable fact. <laughs> 
Stories are about interconnections, they're about interrelationships, they're the, about the, pro they're the product not of observing data, but of experiencing life. And I have to tell you, the older I get, uh, now I think I'm entitled to say that. The older I get, the more I understand that ultimate truths, which is a large part of what we mean when we utter the word God, learning the ultimate truths, are best accessed through our experiences and not in observations and not in inferences, not even in our texts, no matter how sacred they are, or filled with stories and narratives and agadot that are received by us. We can bypass the experiences that we have. I actually think that that's part of what our tradition had in mind when it warned us, warned us and exhorted us to give respect and deference to people who are of older age. They have something, they may not have the same sharpness in analyzing texts and observing data that younger people do, but they have learned things about life and ultimate truths that come from the wealth of experience that they have. You see, many of us go through life, we have different experiences, we take pictures, which is a lovely thing to do, except when they become substitutes for the powerful experience. Pictures don't pulsate, they don't tremble with the presence of the raw encounter. And I'm afraid that we have done something historically very similar with the Torah, which was an important snapshot of that trembling experience of God, which has now superseded the experience. We use that as a substitute for actually finding God in our own inter excuse me, interaction with the world. It all starts with that. It's our only real starting point. So yes, if you think that knowing God requires the clarity of seeing, it turns out that it doesn't require that, it cannot require that, not that clarity. Because that wouldn't be God, as Rabbi Krishna has told you. It would be something counterfeit, it would be something made in our image. God can only be accessed by testifying to what we experience in a somewhat ineffable way. Here's what Robert knows at the late philosopher said, the person who has faith has not passed through an inferential argument. Rather, his belief arises directly out of his being touched and moved in encountering something. And perhaps the faith involved is ultimately a faith in oneself and one's own responses, a faith that one could not be so deeply touched by something in that way unless it was a manifestation of the divine. To not have the belief, then, would be to distrust one's very deepest responses, and that would involve a significant alienation from oneself. <coughs> so it's a trust in your deeper and deepest experiences that guide your own life. That's Lamad Akada. Learn to hear and to respect and to tell the narratives that are the life that you lead, and share them with the community of which you are a part and hear those stories as well. But don't stories leave us in doubt? Did they really happen? How can I be sure that the stories my community tells and retells are better and more valid than those told by others? How can I live with one with that kind of a doubt? So here's one of the antidotes to that. Uh, here's we get to John Sexton who's got his own problems with his faculty right now, I know. But he wrote a, a, a book recently called Baseball as a Road to God. It's a fascinating book, actually. It comes out of a course he teaches at NYU. And he says, each of us consciously or unconsciously decides how much doubt we will tolerate. And sometimes there is a delight to maintaining doubt, even where we might be able to choose certitude, which we certainly can do with God. And on occasion, I myself have made this choice. And then he tells the following story. He's a big, big baseball fan, and a great fan in his youth of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Jackie Robinson in particular. He becomes president of NYU in 2001, and he gets a package from the New York Times. The New York Times package has a letter on top of it that says, 
Congratulations on becoming president of NYU. We know what a great baseball fan you are and what a fan of Jackie Robinson, so we are pleased to be able to present to you this special gift from our archives, a genuine 1955 Jackie Robinson glove. After his delight and awe at holding this in his hand passes, he realizes that he doesn't know what the truth about this glove is. Was it actually worn by Jackie Robinson in the 1955 World Series? Or was it offered by Sears in 1955 with Jackie Robinson's signature on it? He knew that he could call the New York Times and find out. But he couldn't get himself to make that phone call. And then he had found himself having dinner with a group of curators from the British Museum, people who, as he put it, their whole life is devoted to authenticating works of art. And he asked each one of them, if you were in my position, would you make that phone call? And not a single one of them said that they would make the phone call. And here's the real bottom line. Nothing really hung or depended on whether it was Jackie's glove or not. It had nothing to do with what he saw in this magical game, what he saw in the, uh, the heroism of this man and his times and his family. And thus, even to ask the question would suggest that it really did matter. And he, of course, intended us to translate that from the baseball field to the synagogue, to the church, to the mosque and from the language of baseball myths to the language of religious narrative. So let me paraphrase the point that he's trying to make. There are those for whom faith derives from the literal truth of religious accounts. We'd like to be able to see it, if only we could. They feel they have to see, to believe, to know, and they thrill at every archaeological discovery that brings something to them that they can see. And I have known and I have talked to and I have often debated some of these religious literalists. These are the people who might be inclined actually to go looking for the fissure in the earth that swallowed up Korah and his family. But for others, the sacred stories can resonate even though they're not seen as literal accounts, but rather as myths that capture something beyond mere individual historical events. They're pathways to a much deeper truth and the kind that recurs throughout human experience in every age and every life. Barry Schrade told you last night that he thinks that even in the Orthodox community, many people live the way they live, not because they have certainty that it was commanded by a God who was heard and even temporarily seen by the Israelites at Mount Sinai, but because their deepest experiences of life taught them that this is a beautiful and true way to live. For those who insist on taking the stories literally, people who need to see, doubt is a deep, deep threat, potentially causing the story to unravel if contrary facts are shown. But for those for whom the story is a pathway to an ineffable truth beyond, doubt is the reminder to be humble as one confronts the unknowable through faith, knows its faith, faith in your own experiences that there is something transcendent that is animating everything that we do, and never assuming that one has a complete and final understanding of things that can't be captured in articulated propositions. People often write to me or want to talk to me about their doubts, and when I have these conversations, I try to be honest about why I don't really suppose there is a fissure in the earth where Korach was swallowed up, or a skeleton of a talking donkey waiting to be discovered somewhere. And most important, I try to explain to them why it seems wrong and contrary to the spirit of faith even to want to ascertain those things. I try to explain to them that just as a deeply involved fan felt no need to ascertain whether a magical glove was actually used in the 1955 World Series, that I, a deeply involved Jew and a liver of Torah, feel no need to ascertain whether there really is a Mount Sinai. So here's a spoiler alert for those who may not have read or seen the movie The Life of, Life of Pi by Jan Martel. At the end, two stories are told. 
about this remarkable experience of survival. And the Japanese um, interviewers who are trying to find out what made a ship sink hear both of these stories and they're demanding they want to know the truth. And he says to them, I told you two stories. Neither makes a factual difference to you. You can't prove which story is true and which is not. So tell me, since it makes no factual difference to you and you can't prove it, which do you prefer? Which is the better story? And they said, the story with the animals. Thank you, he says. And then he adds, and so it goes with God. If you stumble at believability, what are you living for? Love is hard to believe, he says. Ask any lover. Life is hard to believe. Ask any scientist. And God is hard to believe. Ask any believer. But it's there inside us. So what I'm saying is what Nozick said, that seeing God is a matter of attending deeply to one's own experiences of the world putting them into words so they can be retold, not to dogmatize them and freeze them, but so they can merge with other stories and bring the God that these stories testify to most powerfully into our lives. It's learning to see the invisible God within us. It's more of the drive not to see, but the drive to be seen, the drive to know that we are part of a meaningful narrative in this world. And then we can have the satisfaction and pleasure of trusting the uh, religious experiences we all have and seeing them reflected in the sacred stories that we have inherited. So here's my little twist at the end on that story. You have, this anonymous scholar said to the two great rabbis, you've paid respect to someone who can be seen but can't see. If you pay respect and you accept that we are all blind scholars, that none of us can truly see what we think we fantasize about seeing, and if we accept that and pay respect to that, then you'll be on your road to really being intimate with and recognizing the presence that sees but can never be seen. This is what we need to do in our congregations. Uh, support the, uh, the enterprise of looking within ourselves and sharing the stories of our lives, because that's how we will build up the image of God that is true for us and will be passed on to our children. Thank you.
perceive that it makes our lives significant because they don't go on forever. To feel pain and to be scourged to be hurt, to be outraged by another person's pain. I found God in the impulse to hold the hand of the dying, not lose faith in God because the person is dying. I hope the implication wasn't that you're envious of us for having absolute faith, because I, I can speak for myself. I don't have I don't have absolute faith. Every one of us wavers in our faith from time to time, which is why we have to keep reaching within ourselves to remind ourselves of the powerful uh, experiences that we have of this uh, amazing world that we live in, which includes both pleasure and pain. Uh, I wanted to. I wanted to uh, say just the following, that uh, I was, it was reported to me by a professor of, I think, social psychology at Yeshiva University, that he heard Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik of blessed memory make the following comment. Comfort in uh, Hebrew is, comes, from, is, comes from the root nun chet mem, the nachem, to give comfort. But we use that same root, vayinachem, means he kind of changed his mind. And he said there's no coincidence there. That sometimes the greatest comfort comes from being able to change one's perspective. If one is very centered on the, the painful thing that is happening to me or to a loved one, and everything is about the God who we believe somehow is meant to control all of this, then we will, we will see God as a sadist. There's no other way to put it. But if we can change our perspective in such a way that we understand that God is not that God, and I, I like probably every rabbi in the world has had the experience of people coming into his office and saying, why did the following happen to me? I don't no longer believe in God. And then we ask them to describe the God they no longer believe in, and then we tell them that we don't believe in that God either. If you can change your perspective in such a way that the pain doesn't go away, but the suffering of living in a world where there is that pain, it can be diminished when you are able to see somehow the whole of creation as being something that is, it's us, it's who we are. We all have families that give us pain and disappointment all the time. It's our family. That's what the world is. And the world has a, a creator, a creative force in it, the, the, that which unifies everything. And that's God. Not a sadist, but reality. That's why I love that line in Young Martel, which says, which is the better story? Our liturgy doesn't always do us a favor. There are stories and metaphors written by other people in other times. They have their power. They have the power of tradition. We resonate to them. If we talk, start taking them a little too seriously and too literally, we can be driven out of shul. A rabbi Harold Schulweis tells a story about that in his book, uh, when, uh, For Those Who Cannot Believe. A woman who was just driven out by Natana Tokif and couldn't come back on Yom Kippur. But you have to ask yourself, what, this, is, this is a story that is about responsibility, that is about the, uh, the uh, imperfections and the precariousness of life and the ways in which we can rise above it. Tell your own story that testifies to that, that may not beat you up when it talks about, you know, you're being written in a certain book because of something you did. There can be better stories. The fact that it's printed in the Mahsur doesn't mean it's the last word. Yeah, when I'm asked that question, and I'm frequently asked that question, my answer is yes, that's why we say it in Hebrew. <laughs> That was a more serious answer than you might have realized. 
The purpose of a liturgy is not to negotiate with God. Uh, I'm sorry that we have been brainwashed into understanding prayer that way. Prayer is not begging. Congregational prayer is losing yourself in the context of a congregation, transcending your individuality. The most sublime moments of a high holy day service are not when the or prompts us to say things we are inspired by, it's when we join with 500 other people and we become a single entity. Uh, on the literal aspect of it, the most useful idea I ran across this past year, a recent book by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the outgoing chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, or as a friend of mine constantly reminds me, He's the outgoing chief rabbi of the Orthodox synagogues in the United Kingdom. Brilliant guy. I wish he could bring himself to say something nice about non-Orthodox rabbis. <laughs> but he has one beautiful idea. He says, Greek philosophy and all its descendants in English and other languages think from left to right, and they are left brain. They are factual. They are philosophical. They are logical. Hebrew philosophy, writing from right to left, is right brain. We don't give facts, we tell stories. Uh, did the creation happen in seven days? Of course not. But the idea of a progressive creation bridging the upper and lower worlds, that's true in the sense that Hamlet is true. It's true in the sense that the brothers Karamazov is true. Uh, it's a left, it's a right brain kind of truth. And when you understand the liturgy that way, you realize that the kind of, gee, I'm not sure I believe in that, that's really an irrelevant question. I'm privileged to, to have Rabbi Kushner in my show, and every culinary he reminds us of, of, of this, about uh, liturgy as poetry. And we have time for one last question. How about way in the back? Uh, Rabbi Tucker, you spoke about the relationship between faith and doubt and our desire to see. I'm curious how you see blind faith fitting into that relationship. Blind faith, yes. Wait, do you want to give me your definition of what blind faith is? Uh, well, I'm curious because you see your desire to see and your desire to believe, how they come together, and just your, your desire to see so much that you just believe without looking at any type of reality. I, I'm not sure I accept the, the, the last phrase without without seeing any reality. The, re, the reality, your 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 most emphatic reality, the thing that you know most intimately and know in a way that no one else can know it, is your life. That's why. The, you know, when Michael Fishbane wrote a book a couple of years ago called Sacred Attunement, one of the things that made it such a remarkable book, a difficult book, but a remarkable book, was that he was doing theology not by starting with a text or starting with some argument about revelation, he was starting with religious experience. Because it really has to be the starting point. That's that's who we are. That's so that's it, it, blind faith can have a negative meaning as in I have no basis for doing this, but I'm just going to accept it because someone else told me. And that's often what we mean by it. But I would like to redeem that phrase, I think, by saying that blind faith is a faith that I can have even though I know that the things that I would fantasize about seeing are not seeable. And uh, actually, we're in the Book of Dvarim now. One of the things that the Book of Dvarim harps on over and over again, and it's no coincidence that Shema Yisrael is in the Book of Dvarim, it tells you you do not, you do not, should not expect to see, you did not at signing, and you should never expect to see some visual representation, some seeing is believing, seeing is knowing. Zulati kol, the only thing you have is the voice that comes from within. And to accept that you are blind, but that you can have faith in your deepest convictions and say, I trust my experience of the world to tell me that there is something here, no matter what Christopher Hitchens of blessed memory says, no matter what the reductionist um, uh, 
atheists say, that's a, that's a really honorable and noble blind faith.